This is Acid Horizon, a theory podcast which confronts global crisis and the specter of a world that could be free. This is episode 18, interrogating the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, Karl Marx on alienation and estranged labor. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we are going to discuss a portion of Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, also called the Paris Manuscripts, which comprise a portion of what is understood as Marx's early works. The section we will dive into today is on alienation and estranged labor. One of our guiding questions, in addition to answering what Marx meant by these terms, will be, is Marx's alienation a good concept, insofar as it captures facts about production under capitalism and whether it provides or emboldens the impetus for forms of effective ethical and political action suggested elsewhere in Marx's work? Adam will also talk a little bit about Marx's critique of Hegel in the papers, and hopefully our talk takes some other interesting twists and turns. In addition to Adam, we have Will and Matt with us. So let's start by talking about what's happening in the writing and focus. Yeah, I mean, if you want to get into the primary reading at, at this point, which is you know, the section on our strange labor. So what's happening at this point is he's doing the beginnings of a critique of political economy. But what he's doing is he's taking political economy to task for not fully comprehending its own subject matter. Now, what he means by comprehending is that political economies, uh, what its studies are, are the laws of private property, how they are distributed, et cetera, et cetera. But private property is only ever a presupposition, something that's presupposed and really in terms of the, the subject, you know, the subject, the person who has private property, the needs and the desires, the interests of an owning class and the, the notion of ownership itself is always seen as external to private property. Really, political economy is just dealing with notions of exchange here and presupposing this concept as, as, as at the outset. But what Marx is trying to do here in quite a Hegelian way is sort of show how this presupposition isn't actually uh, something like separate from the notion of ownership and how private property gets used, but rather private property actually... So as far as we have these presuppositions of the laws of private property, there are many things kept external to them, particularly rather than sort of considering the, the substance of all of these laws. What is missing is kind of the subject of private property, the worker, the owner, and the sort of labor, wages. And... What Marx is trying to do here is he's trying to bring the aspect of the work, aspect of the owner, their interests, their humanity and their personality back into the equation. Right. We're often leaving in a very formal uh, sense of what Hegel would call the understanding. Because, you know, in Hegel, the difference between the understanding and comprehension is the understanding just makes presupposes things and sort of splits them apart into certain laws, like in the Kantian sense. So out of its presuppositions... Kant divides, you know, the, the categories of the understanding into these, you know, various quantity, quality, relation, and, and modality. What, what Hegel does is he takes these and actually shows them that actually in the, in the process of trying to think through them, they sort of develop kind of epigenetically out of these things in a much more full sense than what, what Kant does. And Marx is trying to repeat this here. It's probably also worth mentioning, so that um, this was written um, uh, before uh, Marx wrote Capital Volume 1. Um, and they were never published during his um, lifetime. Um, they were never meant to be, really, as far as we, as far as I'm aware. Um, and they do. I think it's it's pretty uncontroversial to say that the manuscripts show a um, a much more humanistic, a much more Hegelian version of Marx than you find later in Capital. Um, and maybe we'll go into this later, but for now, I, I'll just sort of highlight that um, there is a debate about whether we can see manuscripts um, and his other previous works being continuous with the project you find in Capital Volume 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, uh, the French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser in particular um, was well known for claiming that there was a kind of epistemic break um, uh, prior to the release of uh, Capital Volume 1, where Marx essentially moved from what he called, what Althusser called a sort of ideological um, approach to a scientific approach. Um, and by science, is it, what, what I think what Althusser really means is, and you know, Marxists themselves usually mean is a kind of coherent and systematic understanding of the um, 
uh, progression of history and the circumstances in which we live. So there is an open question, which again, maybe, maybe we'll get into this in more depth, um, about whether what we see here in, you know, in, in manuscripts, particularly a lot of this humanistic language about um, the alienation the laborer experiences from, you know, his product, his, his, the, the activity of his production and the, uh, the, the product of that activity and so on, um, wh whether that's continuous or not. Um, but it's certainly a very different marks to what you'd, um, you'd expect to find if the only thing you'd read by him, I think, was Capital Volume 1. I think it's also very different from, I mean, Capital is also fundamentally different from the political project present in the manifesto, too. Um, that, that's why I think early Marx is so fascinating in a certain sense, you know, Craig made this joke, like he put down, uh, metaphysics and, and moved to this sort of scientific understanding of political economy. So he's taking to task right now. And he, you know, he shoots at the political economists too in here, but his, his primary targets are, you know, consist of the young Hegelians, the egoists and so on. Whereas in capital, it's, it's largely... Malthus, Adam Smith, and John Stuart Mill, who tend to find themselves on the other end of the polemics. And I think that can sort of tell you um, the nature of one thing that I do think is consistent between this text and Capital is the essential issue of the inverse relationship between a laborer's output and the value of their labor, right? So the very first paragraph has this sort of wretched inverse relationship that Marx is talking about, right? The, the laborer always tends towards their own dissolution. And I think if we start there, we can sort of then maybe have a conversation about what that does to a human's relationship with others and a human's relationship with themselves. I should also add, before, before we move on to sort of the, the, you know, the, the content of what we're going to be looking at here, um, that the, something something about the influence of these papers, because um, given that they weren't published during Marx's lifetime, um, uh, they ended up actually having a much more uh, important influence mm. in the 20th century, of course, when they were published, yes. um, particularly on critical theory, um, as you find it. So if we say, and I don't think, again, this is not entirely controversial, but um, it, much of it began really with Georg Lukács. Um, he, he seemed to be quite... Um, reliant on many of the themes you find in the early Marx, particularly the idea of alienation, reification, um, other concepts like that, which have a slightly more Hegelian, right. slightly more humanistic um, angle to them. Um, and so these, these sort of texts have actually been quite influential within um, Marxist-oriented critical theory, um, but in a slightly different way to be more orthodox, um, you know, Marxist-Leninist and so on. I, I do think critical theory does a lot to, to chop Marx up. And I think I think that the early Marx is something that comes through in critical theory much more than later Marx does, right? So you get in, in Marx sort of, uh, and Marx will cite this section in, in Capital, the only time Marx will really bring up the manifesto will be to say that the, the, the bourgeois class is creating nothing but their own grave and sort of the, the teleology, I guess I'm going to use that loosely, of <laughs> the immortal science of of uh, of Marx is sort of abandoned in a certain sense in the political uh, works of like say uh, Herbert Marcuse, right? Who at the end of One Dimensional Man says like we're not here to prescribe a politics, we're not here to say that um, that there is sort of an end game to to achieve. We're here just simply to take sort of the ruthless critique of everything that is present in early Marx. So I think that that's absolutely right, and it's not actually something that I've thought of. Before. Before we proceed to our discussion of alienation, the, the one comment that I wanted to make on the text was a methodological point that's pretty familiar to Marx and our way of understanding him. And, and if you're reading the Marx Angles Reader, it appears on page 71, where Marx is talking about the kind of starting point from which we should begin our analysis. He, he wants to avoid going into these just-so stories about how political economy came about. He says, do not let us go back to a fictitious primordial condition as the political economist does. And he goes on to say that we need to proceed from an actual economic fact. One of the base premises of Marx's political economy is like, look, let's just look at what happens under capitalist economic relations. 
happens. It, it basically divides us into two classes. Uh, one is those who are property owners and those who aren't. And those who are property owners become privy to the this process of labor getting transmogrified into capital. I recently read The Origin of Capitalism, and I'll probably botch the name, but it's Ellen Makeson's or Mikeson's Wood. And you can correct me on that later if you're listening. However, this book is really great because it talks about the exact moment in history when market forces transformed into capital. And she cites a theorist who goes by the name of Brenner, and she pegs a moment in the history of British agrarian farmers who at one time did not feel the kinds of market pressures you would feel under capitalism, pushing them into a market. But at one point, the conditions of that society were such where those who were living in rural areas and taking their goods to market were basically pushed to a precipice where they could no longer do anything but go to market with their goods. And that is cited as the beginning of capitalism rather than, for example, it developing in the industrialized centers of England or France. And Wood makes a very hard distinction between what is called the commercialization model and what we understand as a strictly capitalist model of the market. And so I bring this up because I think it's an interesting read, first and foremost, but it connects with what we're going to talk about because that book identifies a very precise moment in history in which workers are forced to turn to the market, sell their labor, and then experience the kind of alienation that Marx is talking about. I'd like to jump in there very quickly if I can, because it'll give a bit more context to what's going on here. Um, so my understanding is Marx would also broadly agree with that. Um, I don't know that he says much about it, or at least doesn't use the, the, the terms he would later develop um, in his text. Um, but in Capital Volume 1, he, he specifically looks at the history of England, and says that um, what you find, not just in England, but in all in all capitalist countries and ones which become capitalist, is a is a process called um, right. primitive accumulation, um, and it doesn't just happen once and end. It's an ongoing process. And the reason why he looks at England is that um, traditionally in the sort of Middle Ages, um, much much of the land was, even if it was theoretically owned by a feudal lord or whatever. Um, in reality, much of it was allowed to be sort of communally farmed and accessed. You could you could let your cows graze on it. You could you know walk across it and so on. Um, and what what eventually happened was the uh, the enclosing of land. Um, and it was essentially in England the really that was sort of what kick started the institution of private property as we understand it. As that's what Marx says anyway in Capital. So that's actually not not very far off what Marx um, himself says, from my understanding. Um, there's this moment in English history, and you can find it elsewhere. It's an ongoing process across the world, and it's got a big influence on in what Marx is writing today about um, uh, globalization and imperialism. Um, it's the transformation of pre-capitalist uh, territorialities into private property, which can then be put to work within the capitalist system. So I just wanted to add that as well. Brenner's thesis is that at that point in history, it's then that British agrarian farmers become subject to market imperatives. And this is one yeah. of the things that that um, that Marx touches on here is that the effect of alienation that is imposed upon a populace through capitalism, one of those effects is this constant sub mm -hmm. subjugation to market imperatives such that no other forms of trade are possible, whereas in a commercialization model, that may have been the case. Marx does touch on this in uh, the general law of capitalist accumulation, um, particularly what you were just talking about, sort of the fact that market-driven modes of economic relations can actually swallow up like uh, sectors of the economy that were once perceived to be sort of separate from it. This can also sort of be seen in, in some of... Um, some of the earlier writings but by Marx too. What's interesting to me is Marx and the origins of capitalism and anti-Oedipus all seem to be in agreement that it isn't until like financial capital and sort of the, the relations between like abstract financial institutions can can be established that we can really truly call it like a capitalist relation. And I think it's important to make this distinction, especially when we think about alternatives to capitalism, because 
it might not be the case that the abolition of a market, a sufficient condition for capitalism's abolition, right? And there are societies that predate capitalism that also have markets. You're absolutely and, right. And this is, an, this is not an argument for or against markets, but it's just, it's important to extract a kernel from these economic analyses to be able to say what exactly makes a market a capitalist one. Maybe this leads us into a. I'm sure you have your own, you know, um, way of getting into this discussion about alienation. But um, one way of thinking about this is that um, one of the main problems Marx sees with this, um, which he sees in the example of the enclosures in England, but you know, you see everywhere, um, is is what he also identifies quite early on in this um, section, which is that those who previously had access to means of subsistence essentially um no longer do and the result is that they have to sell their labor on the market um that is all they have essentially and it's sort of the origins of this split in a certain sense that's probably too bold a statement but it's one way of understanding this split into the two classes is that it's it deprives people of of any kind of access to properties and means of of living um and forces them to sell their labor on a marketplace um through this historical process um which is itself of course um, a form of alienation, right? Uh, which is the theme of this chapter, right? And that was a that was a big point in our episode that we did with Ben Burgess too, right? Once the capitalist system becomes fully installed, really, there's there's no escape except to somehow everyone exit the capitalist system together. Yeah, I think too though that like uh, the the word that is is important here uh, in the 1844 economic manuscripts. Uh, is coercion, right? What truly defines the nature of uh, estranged or alienated labor is it's coerced, right? A man is not at home. Uh, you know, he's he's in the factory. He's co. It it is forced labor. I think is the is what's necessary here. I think it's important to get a a solid understanding of what is meant by alienation here because it's easy to equivocate or confuse definitions. Marx has a very specific definition as it relates to political economy. However, I think uh, compounded into that definition is the feeling of dislocation, uh, loneliness, remoteness, and all of the effective qualities that a capitalist system produces. So as we move forward, I'd like to highlight the connections between those different understandings of the term. But first and foremost, um, when we're talking about alienation, we're talking about commodities, the things that workers produce, one of those things being themselves. One of the commodities that a right. worker creates is mm -hmm. themselves as a commodity that can actually be traded on the market when we're talking about macro level yeah. economics, right? It's important to understand that um, by creating valuable commodities appropriated by capitalists, he or she enhances the capitalist economic strength, thereby emboldening the capitalist to create stronger means of or appropriation of the labor. Thus, the more efficiently a woman or a man works, the more commodities they can create for the capitalist. And they do create something that becomes alien to them. And I think it's interesting to note one thing that David Harvey points out in his lecture series on capital is a laborer confronts this alienation on a number of levels, but in terms of the commodity, they always confront the alienation twice. The first time is in the creation of the commodity and having the commodity appropriated from them by the capitalists. At the end of a working day, the laborer does not go home with the commodities they have created, right? But when the laborer receives their packet of wages at the end of the week or at the end of the month, and they go to market, well, what do they see on the shelves but the thing that they created, right? And so there, now they are confronted by the commodity in its marked up form. Not only that, the laborers who have become consumers then also confront the commodities created by their fellow proletarians. Two, I think that what's great about this text um, is, you know, when you work through capital and then you work through some of the critiques of capital uh, what some people levy against marx is that like he's far too macro of a thinker or whatnot um you know he's not worried sort of about the kind of crypto existential elements of this social relation but all you have to do is point them in the direction of this text right like this this one makes it clear that alienation is the part of a social relation 
right? Like there's a social relation between two individuals when like a laborer walks into a store to buy a shirt or what have you. Like that's a social relation. Um, you know, this might not be explicitly present in the way in which it is here in Capital. But like, two, I think it's important um, to talk a little bit now about how Marx views the human being and sort of what their, quote, life-engendering uh, process is. What, what it is that, that makes them a human being and how a human being is alienated from themselves in this, in this capitalist relation. As Craig uh, just pointed out, that, uh, there's, there's, at least two, there's at least two forms of alienation that go on under, under capitalism. One is, the, one is the activity of production itself, um, and the other is the product that is created. And this is something that I think Marx takes much more seriously in, in Capital as his entire starting point, which is that um, the, the very idea that the thing you create is a commodity is actually a very strange and very um, novel idea in some senses. And it's not one which many people over history have um, been accustomed to. And so what Marx is going to want to say is that um, aside from the other two, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, um, in our, you know, in any human sort of productive work, on the one hand, in, that, in, the, in the process of that work itself, we are alienated in the sense that we become essentially a cog in a machine. Um, and Marx, actually, I think he has a really, there's a quite funny sentence in, um, in the manuscripts on, the, on this uh, section where he says that its alien character emerges clearly in the fact that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shunned like the plague, right? Um, people don't necessarily do this because they love it or that, um, you know, this is what they've always wanted to do. It's firstly that they have to because there is this coercion in, this, in, the, in the form of a market which forces them to take their goods, their, their labor to the market. Um, that's the only thing they can sell in order to survive. Um, and then once you enter into the uh, productive process, um, increasingly, to, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a, um, uh, a sort of abstract process in which the human gets slotted in afterwards, and you're kind of just um, just a cog in this machine. And so it's it's a sort of humanistic thing, a humanistic approach to this, which uh, Will's right. You get much much less of this in capital, but that doesn't mean that he isn't concerned with it. I don't think. No, I think that's right. I, I think just because it's not explicitly present in the way in which it's present here doesn't mean that he's not taking to to sort of task the way in which um because uh, it is sort of present in in capital in the sense that one thing that marx is critiquing is the way in which political economists treat these things with a sort of what he calls a naturalism that like market forces there, there's sort of this belief among the political economists of his day that these are sort of just natural forces and what he's going to try to do in um in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 is sort of talk about the ways in which it sort of uh subverts the natural relations or the way in which capital can sort of hijack uh these sorts of life begetting life processes adam just do your hegelian thing man do it Okay, so if I just take us back a little bit, I just want to take us back to the the essential terminology being used here. So, the title of the text you know, is uh, "De Infremdeter Arbeit." So the, the that's the first term that Marx uses for alienation, and and Hegel's as well. So, "Infremdeter" is estrangement. Yes, yeah, something becoming strange, something becoming other to you. But the other word that is used equally by Marx, so we also translate as alienation, is uh, "intalserung," which is externalization. This this distinction that really, no more or less the same, uh, comes in quite strong in the four categories of alienation that Marx is positing. So you have the first category, the alienation of the product. The product is taken away from you after you've made it. Second, the alienation of the activity. The activity is bought by another. Your body is bought and organized into doing this activity by the other, the person who buys it, who pays your wages. The third is alienation from a people because you only ever interact with a people in this sense of a worker in this in not just the competition between capitalists but the competition between workers to get the jobs the few jobs that are there to 
possibly even get the extra scrap at the table from the capitalists, especially now when you're an entrepreneur of the self, you know, competing with Uber drivers, competing with Deliveroo drivers. But let's get to the fourth alienation, which is the alienation from man's species being, as Marx calls it. Now, this is a very Feuerbachian humanistic kind of thing, and it is definitely Hegelian as well in the sense that if you go to philosophy of right and its parts on property and talking about the free will, Hegel distinguishes between man and animal in terms of the ability to have a self-determining creative kind of will. And this is the sort of thing that Marx is taking of a kind of self-determining creative labor. And it's, it's self-determining in its essence because in a very Sartrean way, the existence of man for Marx ought to precede the realization of its essence. Its essence is always something embedded in it needs to come out. Now, what capitalism does in estranging the products of your labor, the ability of you to work, the ability of you to create and self-determine yourself by enjoying the things that you create and work on, it inverts the entire thing. Your essence is presupposed as being this creative thing, and this creative thing is only ever deployed in the barest sense of keeping yourself alive for poverty wages. Your existence is only ever just maintained. Now, this is undoubtedly something that Marx is coming out from a humanist perspective, given at this point, this is 1844, he has not read, not yet, read the work of Max Stirner. Engels hasn't showed it to him yet, doesn't exist yet. He's a bit later in the year. The, the year has actually changed due to avoid the censors, but that's, that's neither here or there, but Marx is still fully Feuerbachian at this moment. However, there is a sense in which you don't have to read this in a humanist way. Because if we just take all of these different kinds of alienations together from the activity of labor, from the product of labor, from other laborers, from the essence of yourself as a creative being itself, this is, in the end, this is a logical determination. Because what is the most alienating fundamentally is that there is no self-determination. The circle never gets closed. You just keep producing again and again and again to just survive. It's a line keep going. It's, it's, it's a line that keeps extending from itself further and further into more finite temporary things to keep yourself alive. It is work becomes, as in the proletariat, becomes the determination rather than self-determination. Now, in German, determination is Bestimmung, which is also destiny. The destiny of man, in this case, is, is to become a worker. I mean, if you go back to Hegel's logic, uh, finitude, this is the complete fixity of finitude rather than transcending and, and becoming what Hegel calls infinite, which is him the only real reality, which is the line that determines, that gets determination, moves out, and eventually bends back upon itself and becomes self-determining. The line here for the worker would be to create something, to extend yourself into the finite world by laboring on your, with your own finite body on these own finite natural products, and then creating something, and then consuming it, enjoying it, or even leaving it there, completely up to your discretion as the owner of that thing. It simply relates back to you, reflects yourself back to yourself. You don't get reflected back to yourself in capitalist labor. You can make shoes all day, you're never gonna need that many fucking shoes. And really, you don't even need to read this as humanistic. There is a wholly logical determination going here in terms of Hegel's logic of infinity. It's only when Marx brings in consciousness that this revolts into a kind of humanistic diatribe, because, you know, it's all about human emancipation for Marx, at least until he um, reached Turner, and the question is asked, as Deleuze put it, well, we want human emancipation, we want the emancipation of the man. Who is man? Man is simply another idea, another abstraction, and therefore in the way of my self-determination. So there is both a humanistic and an anti-humanistic reading of this, insofar as the logic doesn't really say what, how, it, <laughs> whether it needs to be human here either way. I just think that like, if, you pure, if you look at the text and the way in which Marx uses the word inorganic here, and inorganic life, um, how capital can turn natural processes into sort of a becoming animal for the human being right I, I like also again to to the fact that this form of creation is one that marx kind of does see as inherent to um to human nature and that sort of the human can secure an idea and execute it before like it's done right so i'm going to build shelter right i can imagine this shelter and i build it that's my sort of life gen engendering activity so in the sense that there is a capacity for an anti-humanist reading, I just don't think that that's what Marx is up to here.
when it comes to the humanistic bit, it's not that I'm looking for a humanism or looking for a potential for an anti-humanism. I'm looking for a development of a line of thought in Marx's work. And there's one that can be traced pretty palpably from the writing of this text right to his writing of the of the theses on Feuerbach. And I think it's the theses on Feuerbach provides us with some interesting insight as to how Marx was on the path maybe to an anti-humanism or the the potential for an anti-humanism, but I think it was a question that haunted him throughout the the entirety of his work. And I can just read this section because it's so short. Um, And this is basically Marx's drift, or very marked drift, from Feuerbach. He says... Feuerbach resolves the religious essence into the human essence, but the human essence is no abstraction inherent to each single individual. He goes on to say, in its reality, it is the ensemble of the social relations, right? Feuerbach, who does not enter upon a criticism of this real essence, is consequently compelled And then he has a colon, two points. Number one, to abstract from the historical processes and to fix the religious sentiment as something by itself and to presuppose an abstract, isolated human individual. And number two, this is the important point. Essence, therefore, can be comprehended only as, quote, genus, end quote, as an internal dumb generality, which naturally unites the many individuals. And so one of the things that I think is happening here is I think there are these presuppositions about human essence that you find in Feuerbach that Marx is struggling with, and he does not want to reify them. And his way of resolving them is just by taking the notion of human essence as a point of connectivity. It's not as if the notion of human essence is a thing in itself. What the notion of human essence ultimately describes is just a point of linkage, that which establishes the network of social relations between individuals. I think that the broader implication behind Marx's move here is that not only are human beings part of this network of social relations, but now it opens it up to the possibility of other kinds of beings entering the fold. Hence, we don't have an anti-humanism necessarily, but perhaps a transhumanism. Right. And moving forward, you know, where in the German ideology, um, you know, Marx sort of looks at consciousness and he sort of says that it's, I think, the beginning of a social product, right? Which is much closer to what you're talking about, I think, you know, so in the way in which he, he engages with consciousness, and then this, again, goes back to, to what, to what um, Adam was saying. It is that engagement with the idea of of human consciousness and that that firstness, right? Uh, that is what is ultimately going to kind of haunt or cling to to Marx's work that that will again be sort of parsed out and dealt with in critical theory. And it's also, but this is also on the other hand, you know, even if we say that it is in some sense humanistic, or at least or at least is plausible, you know, to read it that way. I think it's also where Marx becomes possibly at his most sort of relatable in a certain sense. Maybe that's the wrong word. Um, but it is it I think there's many people that what he writes here could really speak to. Um there's this, there's this a central passage where he discusses these form these four forms of alienation which um Adam Adam talked about brilliantly earlier. Um and there's a few there's a couple of sentences where he says, um uh, the worker at work does not develop freely his physical and mental energy, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker therefore only feels himself outside his work, and in his work feels outside himself. He feels at home when he is not working, and when he is working, he does not feel at home. Um, and so, I, I think that probably speaks to a, a lot of people's experience of the world of work. Actually, is and and that's, that's probably where some of the power. Of it, no, it I comes agree. From. I think you know what one thing that's fascinating and remarkable about the work of Karl Marx is that he does extensive theoretical heavy lifting, but the final analysis is always one that really does return to a sort of assertion about the nature of social relations as they exist currently that really can be reflected on by anyone. Anyone can say the sentence about, uh, you know, a person being frustrated at work and only feeling at home when not engaged in any sort of labor, that that is a problem. 
right? So in a sense, Marx is embarking on a sort of social strain of thought that is, again, one that can actually speak to everyone. It's part of the reason why Marx is so influential in a way that that subsequent uh, you know, political economists or Marxians aren't. Because the reality is, and this is can be seen in sort of just looking at the timesheets in the first volume of Capital, is he's just deeply interested in the well-being of individuals. Right. And this is, well, now here I'm going to think against my previous thesis a little bit, but I can't understand the dictatorship of the proletariat being anything else than a bunch of human beings. Right. <laughs> right. So in that sense, I I, I think, I mean, the, the question is, how pointed is... Um, Marx's explicit humanism. But I think what's more interesting to me, just in my reading of it, is how I almost wonder if there's an inherent chauvinism embedded in the concept of species essence or species being as Feuerbach and Marx formulated it. When Marx struggles with the notion of a presupposed individual and and, and basically gives up on it, I, I think it opens us up to these other possibilities. Does Marx need to have him you know, in in ex, sort of presuppose an external individuality? Individuality tends to presuppose itself and get along. Get along yeah, no, he job, doesn't. To be honest. He doesn't. I think the important point is, you know, when it comes to talking about the choices that we can make in a capitalist system, they're not ones that are individually right. motivated. Mm. Right. So, and this is what's important is that the institution of capitalist social relations now creates this new set of imperatives that weren't experienced in pre-modern societies. And it becomes much harder to undertake the kinds of social activity or act in accord with certain interests because of market imperatives. Yeah. I think one thing that I want to, before I hop away, uh, is to say that Yes, are, are these strains of like possible like interpretations of like the deep humanism in Marx? Does it, in a certain sense, date the work? Sure, uh, sure it does. I guess like you know Foucault has that critique in the Order of Things where he says it for this reason it sort of exists in a in a bowl of water like a fish that it can't really exist anywhere outside of this sort of realm of thinking. Um, but two, I think it's part of what makes. Marx's work explicitly political and actionable in that age, in that he was doing two things, right? He was compelling action of a particular series of workers while also operating on a world that was to come. And, you know, Walter Benjamin makes this clear in his work on, on the reproduction of, uh, of artwork, which I just botched the title of. Um, uh, he says that, you know, Marx was working with a world that was to come. Marx was seeing a form of relations and a form of production that was only in its incipience, in its infancy. So there's something remarkable about how he's both attempting to raise consciousness while also not exactly having full direct access to the world that he is ascribing uh, these sorts of dangers to. Yeah, and I think there's something, there's something um, admirable and important as well about what you find in, in these texts, which is the focus on what it actually means for people to live and exist in a system like this, right? Um, I suspect mo most people don't come to someone like Marx because, you know, he gives you the best theoretical explanation of capitalism. I mean, some some people might, right? Academics and people and theorists and so on. But I suspect most people, their interest in someone like Marx is born out of their own experiences of a world in which they live and work and have grown up in, right? Um, and that's what Marx can speak to here. This um, widespread sense of alienation um, in, in in all these different forms, you know, from the work that you hate but have to do because you've got no other way of surviving, from the fact that you have no control over the things that you do create in most cases, um, from a competition in which you constantly find yourself in um, with others, and as you know, Adam, you know, there'll be on, you know this sort of entrepreneurial sort of subjectivity. Um, you know, Byung Chil Han, I think, talks about this quite a bit as well. You know, um, the and also importantly, um, our alienation from you can you know wince a little bit when Marx uses a phrase like species being or whatever, right? But fundamentally, what he's saying is that um, humans have a capacity for free creativity and productivity in a much less narrow, much less mechanical way, um, which can all which could lead lead us all to live better, freer, more fulfilling lives, and so. In a certain sense, I think that that humanistic um, angle to it 
um, speaks much more to people's actual sort of lived experience of 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 this kind of social system, which I think is always quite well, quite refreshing, really. Yeah, but there's a, there's a sense in which the humanism sort of holds back from taking on some of the uh, yeah, the, the, the actual bottom or you know, the most intense forms of, of proletarianization and the alienation of labor. Because you know, Craig, you said earlier that. Um, yeah, you, know, you can't imagine the dictatorship the pros here as being anything by human beings. But the dictatorship is a dictatorship of the interests of one class over the other, the privilege or uh, social organisation. But you know, quite you could easily on that basis, you could easily imagine um, a dictatorship of the proletarianized rather than the proletariats. And that's so. In that sense, you could also imagine the quite an, uh, an agrarian or sort of vegan model of social organism there, because I mean, who is more who? Or who or what is what beings are more proletarianized than, than, than the agricultural animal? And insofar as hey, hey, you can sort of extend Hegel's logic of self determination that Marx is using here into a sort of the self determination of the productive and reflexively self understanding being, despite Hegel's own comments on animals, I think there's something definitely we can definitely extend it to. But just just as a further point, I think I'd like to push back on, on Marx a little bit. I think in a way that I think he might very well agree with and that there is a sense to which alienation isn't necessarily something always that you know that's always to be pitied because if we take the second sense of alienation and entalserung and in the text marx still uses uses both entalserung and on fremdung in fremdung sorry in a, in a negative way but entalserung just means externalization and if you had the free ownership of your labor. Externalizing yourself is, it's fun. We're doing it right now. We're recording our, voice, our voices and we're putting it out there. We are doing externalization. We're doing, in the Greek word, kenosis, putting yourself out. And that's something quite pleasurable because you can see yourself reflected back in it. I think alienation should not always be read in the purely negative sense. If you, It's the idea of an alienation which doesn't circle back round. It's the alienation that has to keep going and going and going and always reaches out into infinity, never comes back to affirming the reality of itself. It's, it's a non-eternally recurring uh, alienation in that sense. I agree with you. And uh, up until now, I've been sticking to kind of a just on the page strict reading of Marx, but I, I agree with that pushback. And here I think we can in invoke Zizek somewhat when he talks about, I want to keep some of the alienation <laughs> that I experience under capitalism as, as a condition for moving forward. Um, and I think you're right because we, we do need to disentangle the notions of alienation as something that extends into infinity versus this kind of uh, notion of diffuseness or extension or I don't know. Even the even the word compartmentalization has such negative connotations sometimes, but I'm happily compartmentalized in some venues, right? Like there's ways in which I don't want the entirety of me to appear somewhere. I would like to be alienated from most of my most of my organs. I don't want to have to operate them personally all the time. Zizek's arguing for alienation the same way that, you know, you don't want, you know, you, you, you'd like certain things your body to go automatically, please. I don't want to like manually pump each heartbeat. So we do just have to go and vote, you know, for what, what, what new filter is try out at the water supply. Uh, during the pandemic, I was engaging with the Deleuze and Guattari reading groups online. And I just had mentioned in passing to someone that I don't know who my neighbor is and I never have after living here in Los Angeles for more than 15 years now. And they immediately pointed out, why are you privileging the local? And it made me think, you know what, you're right, because during the course of this pandemic, I was able to meet the wonderful people who are on this podcast here. We've never had physical contact with one another, but we can do something creative and that that defies a, a sort of conventional or pre-modern understanding of space, of of individuality of persona, right? And those are things I think moving towards a freer and more just society, I don't want to lose. And in fact, I'm curious to experiment with that even more. I think I think all this is is fine, except that it it, it possibly misses what Marx is really um looking at in 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 his time when he when he uses this term alienation, what it is but what it is that he's attempting to describe when he just, when he, when he calls these, these things alienation, and he's looking at um, extremely poor and overworked and exploited people in coal mines and factories working enormous long hour shifts with terrible pay, terrible working conditions, very few rights, um, and very little free time in which to do anything creative. 
Um, and that's not gone away, right? It's one of my problems with certain um, contemporary Marxists. You've, I, I, I love a lot of what Negri and Hartwright, for example, but they have this idea that uh, labor has changed and it's now about intellectual labor, rather you know, more so than it is about physical labor. Um, but of course, that hasn't actually really occurred. All that's happened is that, that the, the sort of global distribution of that labor has changed and it's been pushed over into um, areas like you know Africa and uh, East and Southern Asia and so on. Um, so in the West, we don't see it. And so I think I agree with pretty much with everything just said, except that um, there's a very real sense in which the um, the effect that this kind of exploitation has on um, on a human being is a really real thing, which matters perhaps more than um, you know the satisfaction that you know as much satisfaction as you know I am sure the rest of the people in this podcast get from podcast. There's a really important sense, I think, in which that Marx in which Marx can speak to uh, speak to the, the violence done against against sort of you know to use a you know loaded sort of term you know the sort of the human the human spirit or whatever you know so I, that, that's all i would say on, on that one but otherwise I, I broadly agree yeah no that's a good point and and it makes me think and and i i've thought about this myself is you know to what extent can we uh disentangle the the notion of alienation that that adam and i were just riffing on versus bringing it back to what what marx was actually talking about because yeah you know in the agon of post-industrial capitalist world, it was the struggle between the capitalists and the laborers that in some sense collectively brought about the conditions uh, for the possibility of living the kinds of lives that we're living right now. And this is not to excuse the injustices or the, you know, the harms that have been committed upon laborers for what are now centuries. But here we are. We are kind of in what Deleuze and Gattari call a middle right now. We, we exist under a set of conditions with their own distinct possibilities. And I think the question is, how do we use the world that we have been thrown into with all of its technology, all of its automation, all of its history and understanding to create the new world? I'm reminded of Terry Eagleton's idea that Marxism is a theodicy of sorts in the sense that achieving the kind of emancipation that he dreams of requires the telos of history, including the development of capitalist society as the society which will provide the conditions for the possibility of a new future. Can I say one thing before I'd love I'd love for us to, to return to that actually because there's, there's a paper, a blog post I, I referenced in a previous episode but relates to this. I wanted to say very briefly that um, the Philosopher Georg Lukács, who I mentioned earlier, Hungarian philosopher deeply involved in the uh, sort of Soviet uh, regime as well. Um, he talks quite quite a lot about the this um, about alienation and and also reification, which are, I think related concepts a lot of the time go often go hand in hand. Um, and he has this idea, and he's writing I think in 1927, if I remember correctly, and he says that from the perspective of from the abstract perspective of labor, uh, from no, of, of, the, of, of the productive process, sorry, from the abstract perspective of the productive process, the human being itself actually becomes a um, a flaw, uh, a fault to be ironed out and removed as soon as possible. Um, you have, there's from the ideal productive uh, perspective, it's pretty um, uh, irritating, really, that human beings need to eat, sleep, rest, socialize, reproduce, etc. Um, because that kind of interferes with the um, optimal, um, ideal productive process, right? And so he says, what we'll find increasingly, and this was in 1927, again, the sort of quite early, you know, stages of this, but increasingly, he thinks that the human will be removed in as far as possible, and may in fact, um, be removed entirely. And there's an open question there about whether that's good or not in a, in, a, in a long term, you know, automation or whatever. But for him, it's a very real um, uh, and damaging phenomenon to the people who do to people who do work um, because they're an inconvenience and a liability and are treated like they are um, by their often by the, by, by the bosses and managers, and they become this kind of, as Mark says, a kind of cog in the wheel. Um, and that was that was Lukacs' perspective, anyway. Back in, I think it was twenty seven. 
I think that sets up a wonderful discussion topic on Marx and accelerationism that we'll have to pick up very soon sometime. And if you're tuning into Acid Horizon for the first time, thank you for joining us. As always, I want to say thank you to all the patrons and supporters who have committed to this project or have supported it in some way. You can support us on Patreon or you can support our merch store, which might be in the show notes, depending on where you're listening. We have an episode on science fiction coming up for you in the near future. Also, our Halloween episode will be Mark Fisher's The Weird in the Eerie. We hope you come by and check us out once again. Until next time, stay healthy, read good books, and listen to more Acid Horizon. Thank you.